Good morning. Welcome to IUCC. We're the Wall family. I'm Bill Wall. I'm Sarah Wall. And I'm Eliza Wall. And we've been members of IUCC for about two and a half years. And our favorite memory, among many, is actually our very first day that we ever attended an IUCC service. We knew in our hearts that we were looking for a new home that was open and welcoming and inclusive. And after that very first day, we knew we had found where we belonged. We were welcomed by so many members and we were thrilled to have finally found what we were looking for in our church community. Thank you for joining us this morning. Our service will begin shortly.
morning. morning. Welcome to Irvine United Congregational Church and our second service. It's good to see all of you here. And if you feel comfortable, you could come a little closer, but you're okay the way you are too. Um, We're glad that you're here. I am Pastor Sarah, and we are an open and affirming just peace, global missions, creation, justice, progressive Christian congregation of the United Church of Christ. And I'm glad that you're here this morning. We seek to be a diverse, multicultural, multi-generational congregation. And by being here together, we live into that vision. I am still high from our installation service. Many of you were there last week. I want to thank you for that. In four days, I'll be celebrating my two-year anniversary with you. So as we said multiple times, it came a little late, but it was really a celebration of who we are and the resiliency of our congregation as we come out of the pandemic together. We're continuing to rebuild, and particularly in this service, we're looking to how do we rebuild the second service together. I hope you be part of those conversations. Um, In fact, there is a conversation coming up tomorrow, a worship exploration conversation, and it particularly affects those of you who are here at second service. So I hope that you can come to that. But it was a wonderful day last Sunday. Thank you to all who attended. I want to thank the search committee. Uh, Many of those members are here today. Thank you. Without you, that wouldn't have happened or it would have happened with somebody else. (laughs) But I'm sure glad it happened with me and I'm thankful to all the work that you did. It was a wonderful day. Uh, The installation committee members worked very hard to make it a really beautiful celebration, and thank you to all of them as well. Um, And now that means we're getting back to work. We've celebrated, and now it's time for us to roll up our sleeves and do some justice, share some love, and walk together as a community as we live into the vision of IUCC for ourselves and for our contribution to Orange County. If you are a visitor here today, welcome. We're so glad to have you. Thank you for joining us. We have some visitor cards that were at the table in the narthex when you came in. Um, And you can also head to our website, poke around while you're there, get to know us. Uh, If you go to iucc.org slash visitor, you will see a form you can fill out so we can relate back to you and um, connect with you. If you would like to follow along with the service, you can just do so by following along the screen Or you can pull out your phone and use this QR code that is up on the screen, which will give you a link to the bulletin, and then you can follow along with all of us. If you need to use a hearing device, we do have those available in the tech booth. Donnie and Bobby can get those for you. Um, And would love it if you would sign in. We have our red books that are at the end of the aisles. If you'll sign your name, and in fact, you might want to put a line underneath the, uh, the people who sign in from first service so we know who you are. And then you can sign that and then pass it back to the person next to you so you can see who you're sitting next to. We have a lot going on this week. Beginning right after the service, there is an advocates meeting. So we invite you to join the advocates ministry. They are online. They're also going to be in person in the peace room. Right after the service, I am heading to University Synagogue where I will be participating with, um, with all of them on their Bible on trial. And that's a very fun event where they literally will take a Bible story, and in this case it's going to be the Tower of Babel. And two famous lawyers, we're all familiar with Erwin Chemerinsky, who is the dean of, of the whole Cal Law School, and Lori Levinson, and they are going to go head to head. One of them is the prosecutor and the other defendant defending the people who built that tower. And the audience is the jury. So it's a really fun afternoon. I'll be sort of filler <laughs> while the audience is voting. The panelists will be discussing the text and um, the implications that we see for it. So that will be a fun way to experience a little educational and multi-faith um, opportunity. Speaking of interfaith, we want to invite you. We are hosting the Interfaith Council Luncheon right here at IUCC on noon at noon on this Wednesday. So with hosting, you don't have to do a whole lot, but your presence matters and being able to welcome those folks among us. 
We talked about what, how wonderful it was to have so many interfaith leaders with us this past Sunday at the installation. So it's an opportunity for us to really lean into our commitment to doing interfaith work. Um, Felicity Figueroa is with me on the board, and she's here today, so you can ask her about it. But um, noon on Wednesday, come a little early, help me set up. But um, it'll be a wonderful time. You don't have to do any work, just be here. Next week is a fun Sunday. We will be celebrating the blessing of the animals. In the morning, we're not bringing animals. So don't bring your animals to church next Sunday morning. But do bring your animals to church at 3 p.m. for an outside service. It'll be so fun. I, I love the opportunity to bless animals. I think I've blessed all sorts of different kinds, and I'm always looking forward to the most creative animal to come to our sacred space. So whether it's been stick bugs or geckos, flying squirrels, or just your average dog and cat, I am looking forward to celebrating with you. And also something really special is an opportunity to memorialize pets. I think that pets become so much a part of our family, and culturally there really isn't um, a ritual to do something like that. But we recognize that they are part of our families, and there's an opportunity for us to memorialize. So you might also want to bring a picture of, of your pet if they've died recently. Sometimes we'll bring collars or leashes or something little, something that's, that's affectionate for them. Um, so I hope that you can come and join us, and I'd love to tell you more about that soon. Um, we also, next Sunday, will have a welcome luncheon following the second service. That's for anybody who's a visitor, so we can tell you a little bit more about IUCC, who we are, we'll give you a tour, we'll feed you lunch, and um, we'll look forward to hearing your stories as well. So if you're interested in that, please let me know. We'd love to have you next week. Um, and let me just reiterate how I would love to have your feedback, specifically regarding this service. This is, this is our opportunity to lean into what new creative possibility we can do together here in our second service. So there will be a conversation tomorrow, and I hope that you find it on Zoom and join along. There are so many ways to participate in the life and ministry of the United Church of Christ here in Irvine, but one of the most important things we can do is be present is to be here now, to connect with one another, to connect with our God, and to experience the love of community as we share that love back into God's world. So thank you for being here. Welcome. Our intro today, just as you can follow along with us, was probably written somewhere around the year 1600. We're going to be singing in German. The words are Sing dem Herrn, Alleluia, alle lieben ihn, lobe seinen Namen, sing it mit Tamburin und Harfe, which means sing to God, Alleluia. We all love God, praise to God's name, sing it with timbrel and harp. So we hope you enjoy this round by Michael Pretorius, Sing dem Herrn.
please join me in a call to worship. We are called to the lives of prayerful awareness of ourselves and our community and the world. May we be awakened to the voice of Jesus who calls us to faithful action. source of goodness in the sight of the world. I also want to tell you a tiny bit about our anthem. It's in a gospel style, and it is called The Storm is Passing Over, and we're dedicating it to the, uh, as COVID gets out of our life, when we come back from isolation, being together. And so it's called The Storm is Passing Over. And you'll have a part. You'll figure out that. <laughs> for a fresh word, and today I'm thinking about stuff. Sometimes I really want something that I can't have. 
sometimes I don't want to share my stuff with someone else. It can get pretty complicated. What's something you have that's important to you? What's special to me is my treasure box. Um, this is what's special to me in my treasure box. This is Boo. She's so important because she's my very, very, very best friend. And I think my grandma gave me a hug when I was very young. And candy and TVs. Those are some pretty cool things. Hmm, what about people in your life? Can you tell me about someone in your life who's super important to you? Some special people in my life is my dad, my brother, Bill, and my mom, who's filming this video right now. My family, my dogs, my cat who passed away. They're important to me because they care for me and I care for them and their family. This is my dog, Maggie, and she is also special to me. Wow, those people sound awesome. Now, what if your important person really wanted to play or use your important thing? If somebody wanted to get use those things, I would say, no way! You, you should get those yourself. You should use your own money. You're not going to use mine. I would make sure that they would take care of her and not, and not do anything bad to Bill. If uh, someone wanted my treasure box or Maggie, I would feel sad. Sometimes it can be really hard to share the things we love, even with the people we love. I have one last question for you. I read this silly old word in the Bible the other day, and I was wondering if you wanted to take a crack at guessing what it means. The word is mammon. What does that word sound like to you? Please show us mammoths from, from the Jurassic time. It also makes me think of Jurassic Park and Jurassic World and all dinosaur stuff. Mammon actually means money, and money is what we use to buy really cool stuff. Jesus tells us that how we use our stuff is really important. Maybe you have a friend you're playing a video game with and you get a little irritated with them because they're asking when it's their turn. It's okay to be irritated, but just take a deep breath and tell them that it can be their turn once this round is over. I'll tell you a little secret. Even adults have to practice taking a moment to take a deep breath and to respond calmly. So let's all try to have a little bit more patience with ourselves as we try to value the people in our lives more than stuff. After all, Jesus says that who you are and what you do is more important than all the stuff that you have. Have fun at Sunday school and keep it fresh. Keep it fresh. Keep it fresh, time for Sunday school. Making it rain. justice and peace we acknowledge that you are the power behind everything that exists and that nothing exists outside of your power we invoke your presence although you are with us at all times with awe we experience your creation the birth of a child a hummingbird flying a butterfly landing on a beautiful flower the grandeur of the grand canyon and the raw power of a volcano or tidal wave, majestic mountains that go up to the clouds. Guide us and help us to enjoy your creation and to take much better care of the earth. We are inundated by thousands of pieces of information every day that we must process. There are so many distractions in life that pull us away from the things that are most important. Concerns about family, jobs, and ourselves can keep us from focusing on the life and teachings of Jesus. And it keeps us from a life that has a discipline of daily prayer and devotion. 
God, awaken in us new dimensions of faith. Open our hearts to more and better loving, including love of self, and better knowing, experiencing, and accepting your love. Continually freshen our belief in racial and economic justice and empower us to act on this belief in order to make a difference in the world. Give us hope for the future. Give us strength for daily living. Help us to grow spiritually, avoiding all distractions. Help us to embrace and celebrate life deeply, appreciating all of the abundance that you have given us. And grant us solidarity and a spirit of unity as we seek to fulfill the mission of our church. We pray for those who are marginalized, who are the other, and those that are living near us. We hope that they will find our church and experience a total and unconditional acceptance. There are people in our church who are hurting in body, mind, and spirit. As their names appear on our screens, let us hold them in our hearts and minds. It was a wonderful thing that Tom Silk was able to attend church last Sunday. This was quite an accomplishment for Tom. Please join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Creator, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's raise our voices as a congregation. Your hymnal is right next to you in uh, by your chair. Go ahead and pick that up. And we're going to be doing number 23, There's a Wideness in God's Mercy. There are two verses, and we will sing them both. Please stand in body or in spirit.
thank you for being a part of our intentional progressive Christian community. As we pass the offering plates this morning, we give thanks for the generosity and commitment of our community. You can also give online at iucc.org slash giving or by placing a gift in the offering boxes in the narthex or send a check into 49115 Alton Parkway in Irvine 92604. Thank you. Holy and loving God, we thank you for the gifts of our lives and the opportunity to share them as you have shared the gifts of life with each of us. We give back to your community as we seek to serve you, your world, its people, so we can live in the kingdom and share it in the love. For the people of IUCC, we give thanks. For the word, for the world, we pray. Amen. Our second hymn also comes from the hymnal today. Uh, I meant to mention, too, you can look up on the screen if you don't want to uh, look at the hymnal. But we, if you do, it's number 565 today, God Whose Giving Knows No Ending. And we'll be singing verses 1, 2, and 4, but not verse number 3. So please stand up by your spirit as we sing together one more time. Then Jesus said to the disciples, there was a rich man who had a manager and changes were brought to him that this man was squandering his property. So he summoned him and said to him, what is this that I hear about you? Give me an accounting of your management because you cannot be my manager any longer. Then the manager, the manager said to himself, 
what will I do? What will I do now that my master is taking the position away from me? I am not strong enough to dig. I am ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do so that when I am dismissed as a manager, people may welcome me into into their homes. So summoning his master's debtors one by one, he asked the first, "How much do you owe my master?" He answered. A hundred jugs of olive oil. He said to him, "Take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it fifty." Then he asked another, "And how much do you owe?" He replied, "A hundred containers of wheat." He said to him, "Take your bill and make it eighty." And his master commended the dishonest manager because he acted shrewdly. For the children of this age are more shrewd in dealing with their own generations. That are the children of light, and I tell you, make friends for yourself by means of this honest wealth. This honest wealth, so that when it is gone, they may be they may welcome you into the eternal homes. Whoever is faithful is in a very little is faithful, also in much, and whoever is dishonest in a very little is dishonest also in much. If then you have not been faithful with a dishonest wealth. Who will entrust you to the true riches? And if you have not been faithful with what belongs to another, who will give you what is your own? No slaves can serve two masters, for a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. So what is going on with this story, <laughs> right? Were you paying attention to it? I have so many questions, don't you? Okay, so verse ten sounds like something that we might look at during stewardship. Whoever is faithful in very little is also in much. Whoever is dishonest in very little is dishonest also in much. Sounds about right. We've heard that before. Not quite stewardship time yet, so we're not there. But you know, we get it. We've all heard that before. We cannot serve two masters. You cannot serve God and wealth. Or as Wendy reminded us, the untranslated word was mammon. But you read the whole passage with me, didn't you? It doesn't really feel like it wrapped up as well as verse thirteen would like us to think. So what is going on here? So let's jump right in. First off, what's the name of this passage? Anybody know? Over the years, passages have acquired headings so that it's easier for modern readers to find them. These titles are not original to the text, but it's often how we refer to the stories amongst ourselves, like the parable of the Good Samaritan, or the parable of the Prodigal Son, or the Lost Coin. And all of these are Lucan parables, by the way. And if you ask me, Luke has the best parables, except for this one. It's um, it's different. Let's just say that. Now you can tell by the headings that the editors didn't know what to do with it. It has been called many names over the years and over the translations. It's called sometimes "Parable of the Unjust Steward." Parable of the penitent steward. I've heard also the shrewd steward or the dishonest manager. Whatever you call it, it's also been called the most difficult parable of all. And Jesus had some difficult parables. For some of us rule-following oldest children, there's that particularly hard one, the prodigal son. That's the chapter that immediately precedes this one, and it's hard. But in the end, okay, I get it. It does seem very unfair that the oldest child was faithful and the younger squandered everything. But I understand that Jesus tells us that this is really about God's love, and God loves us and celebrates us no matter what we do. 
God, like the father in the parables, will love us unconditionally and will rejoice when we come back home, when we return to God. But this one, this one is even more challenging. So there's the owner and his manager. And the owner realizes that the manager has been dishonest. So the manager figures out real quick that he's going to get fired because the owner basically tells him so. And he knows that he's not a very employable guy. I'd have to dig, but I'm not strong enough. Maybe farm, but I don't know how. I'll have to beg, but I am too ashamed to do something like that. Oh no, what am I going to do if I get sacked? I'll be destitute. I'll have to face all these people who hate me. And then he gets a bright idea. I'll make them a deal. And then they'll like me better and they'll welcome me into their homes. So he goes out to the owner's clients and settles their debt, but at a much lower rate. You owe him a hundred jugs of oil, make it 50. And you, a hundred containers of wheat, how about 80? He figured this way they would like him. And when he was out of a job, they'd remember how he had so graciously and generously cut them a deal that they would be grateful to him and they'd show him some mercy when he was fired by welcoming their homes to him. Only a strange thing happened, right? We expect the owner will fire him on the spot. Maybe even jail him. Who knows? Sentence him to life imprisonment or murder even. I don't know. They're going to get this guy. Because he's been so dishonest, has cheated him out of everything. But the owner when finds out what he's done, instead of being upset with the manager that he hasn't gotten his clients to pay up in full, he's pleased. This guy, who was already identified as dishonest, is now more dishonest and is praised for acting cleverly in one translation and shrewdly in others. Why would he do that? In most parables of Jesus, the owner or master is supposed to be God. But why would God praise someone who's dishonest? And who, when realized that there would be consequences, this guy doubled down on those consequences and shorted the owner. So shorting God? No wonder nobody wants to preach on this text. Somehow I avoided it for almost 20 years in the pulpit. But... It's actually the gospel reading in today's lectionary. So I decided not to avoid it any longer. Look, the disciples don't get it. Even the writer doesn't seem to understand it. The Jewish annotated New Testament sums up what most of the commentaries I've read feel by stating, the parable defies any fully satisfactory explanation. So, If you didn't get it either, don't worry, you're in good company. So I went to look at what the Jesus Seminar says. Some of you are very familiar with the Jesus Seminar. They met in the 1980s and the 90s to vote on the authenticity of Jesus sayings. If you're familiar with them, you might remember that they rated the sayings based on their scholarly interpretations, designating them by colors. So that red represented what they believed Jesus may have actually said. They believed Jesus said it. They rated it pink if they felt like it was Jesus-like, but maybe he didn't actually say it, or, or maybe it came from a different gospel, and the gospel writer changed it up a little bit, so it got a pink. Gray meant that it was very unlikely that Jesus said it. This was probably the hand of, of somebody else that came later. And black, nope, no way. Jesus didn't say it. Definitely the work of the writer or a later editor. So, what do you think this strange and confusing parable got? I heard a red. Red, red, red. You're right! Red! Red! I cannot believe it! Verses 1 through 8 came in red. Of course it did. The passage that we want to ignore. The passage that we don't understand. The passage that seems to make absolutely no sense. 
They say Jesus said it. Oh, my goodness. I had to preach on it. So we probably shouldn't ignore it. Then what are we supposed to make of it? Well, some have surmised that the dishonest manager was dishonest because he was actually, like, building it up more. So he gave himself a cut of what he was taking originally. So maybe he was like those despised tax collectors that were known to have collected for themselves. So perhaps when he went out to settle with the owner's debt, he simply opted to forego his cut, thereby ensuring that the owner got what he needed and he just selflessly gave up his own portion. But half? I mean, do you really think the markup that he was going to get half of that when there was a hundred jugs of oil? No, I don't think so either. There wasn't a 50% markup. If that's the case, then he really was dishonest. But I don't think that's the explanation for why the owner was so pleased. Was the owner just content with debt reduction and happy to get something instead of nothing? Maybe, but good luck managing someone else's clients and forgiving their debtors without asking anyone first. Debt forgiveness. That's a hot topic these days, isn't it? It's funny how strongly we feel about forgiving debt, even though it's such a biblical concept. Some of us just got word that we're to receive forgiveness on our student loan. Up to $20,000 for Pell Grant recipients and up to ten dollars for the rest of us. And the moment it happened, you could almost hear both the hallelujahs and the grumbles erupt at the exact same time. It doesn't seem fair. And so even though that forgiveness comes as a relief to so many, the grumbling from those who are not the beneficiaries of that forgiveness, but are, who also are not the owner, can be heard throughout the nation. That's why this parable is so completely impossible for us to understand because we are not comfortable with forgiveness of debt, even when we pray for it every day, or at least every week. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Now, I suppose it would make more sense for us if this dishonest manager wasn't the forgiver, if it was the owner himself, right? Then the dishonesty part would be taken away, and we wouldn't have to wrestle with that. It would be this generous, merciful owner who forgives debts. An easier parallel if we were to understand the owner as a stand-in for God. But then the explanation that we get makes even less sense. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of dishonest wealth, so that when it is gone, they may welcome you into the eternal home. What? Is Jesus justifying unethical behavior? Okay, so I get it if you're talking about Robin Hood. All right, Robin Hood. Stealing from the wealthy to get to the poor. Okay, that's got some selflessness to it. I, I'm feeling it. But the motivation of our manager seems like it was just for himself, so that he would have friends to take him in after he was fired. The final three verses make sense on their own but not really in the context of the parable. Whoever is faithful in very little is also faithful in much. And whoever is dishonest in a very little is dishonest also in much. If then you have not been faithful with dishonest wealth, who will entrust you to the true riches? And if you have not been faithful with that which belongs to another, who will give you what is your own? Now it seems like it's switched back to admonishing the dishonest manager for not being faithful. Or is it praising his actions, assuming that the owner got his wealth? by dishonest means. That's not even expressed in the story, though. So, hmm. The end I get. We can't be faithful to God and wealth. We cannot have two masters. This resonates with the Jesus we get repeatedly in Luke, reminding me of the admonishment of the rich man and the warning about how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God for the wealthy. But you put all this together, and it is a very confusing passage. So, pastor, what does it mean? Well, here is where I am really glad that we are at IUCC and not some other church, 
Because if you will remember, my job is not to tell you what to believe. It is to ask you about what you believe. There is no better illustration of our task to wrestle with our faith than this. So in real Jesus fashion, I'm going to leave you here to figure out what it means for yourself. To sit in the discomfort of not having everything neatly wrapped up. To puzzle with this enigmatic story and try to make sense of why Jesus would have said it. Amen? Okay. But before I do, I am going to do that to you. But before I do, I'm going to let you have your wrestling time. But I do want to share with you that I did do a lot of reading on this passage. Trying to make sense of it. Some will try to give you easy answers. Perhaps some answers that you've heard before. Like the moral of this story is to learn to use money shrewdly. That we should save and give generously to charitable causes instead of running up debts. We should not buy, friends, but use our material resources for kingdom priorities to disciple and win others with an emphasis on that graduated tithing. The more I have, the more I give. Be shrewd. Be wise. There's some good stuff there, but I don't know. Maybe? It worked at some other church, but it wasn't going to work here. Most shared the same sentiment of confusion that we've already discussed. But I was really taken by a blogging pastor, the Reverend Rob McCoy, a Methodist in Illinois, who, when he was asking himself the same question that we're all asking, where's the good news here, said, I think it comes down to the same place that most of Jesus' strange stories come to. Relationships. At the beginning of the story, we have many strained relationships. There's a strained employer-employee relationship. There are debts and debtors. What are we left with at the end of the story? Reconciled relationships and canceled debt. It makes no sense for the owner to praise someone for canceling the debts people owed him. He did not get what was coming from, for, to him, and yet he celebrated. Pastor goes on. Jesus is trying to teach us something about the nature of relationships and money and our relationships with money. Perhaps the manager was praised because he put relationships ahead of money. Of course you could and probably would argue that his motivation was less than pure. But in the end, he valued his ability to be invited into people's homes over his ability to please his boss. And maybe the owner cared more about his manager's heart than he did about his bottom line. Wow. So of course the Pharisees didn't get it. They valued money. And they understood that having money was the same as having God's favor. Perhaps we struggle with the same equivocation. That when we've done well for ourselves, we're pleasing God and we can give more money. It's almost transactional. But Jesus is reminding them and us that there are things in this world that are more important than wealth. Perhaps the level of confusion that this parable stirs up is evidence of how remarkably important it is. This one just blows our mind because it seems to go against all of our common understanding of fairness. And that's just it, folks. The kingdom of God has little to do with fairness. It has little to do with keeping proper ledgers and making sure that everybody gets what's their due. The kingdom of God is about relationships. Heck, that's why we use the word kingdom to illustrate relationships, family, connections. After all, it's all about reconciliation. It is about forgiving our debts as we forgive our debtors. Certainly not an easy story to hear, but then again, it rarely is. It's sometimes an even harder story to live. It usually is. It doesn't make good economic sense, but Jesus had a funny way of not making sense, didn't he? 
It doesn't make sense to plant a weed in a garden. It doesn't make sense to run a whole vat of flour with some leaven. It doesn't make sense to turn your other cheek, to throw a party for people who won't invite you or can't invite you to theirs, to leave behind a whole flock of sheep because one little sheep strayed, or throw a party for your good-for-nothing son who finally came back with his tail between his legs. That doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make sense that Jesus would do all he could for a people that would respond by nailing him to a cross. It doesn't make sense that the tomb was empty or that disciples have been able to experience Jesus in the breaking of bread for centuries since his death. None of this makes sense. This parable definitely takes the cake. It is absolutely a strange one. It is a challenge. It is a challenge to look at what canceling debt really looks like. It is a challenge to look at how I serve wealth over God. How can I serve God better? It is a challenge to look at how I spend my money, how I save my money, how I treat others. It's a hard one, all right. But maybe that's exactly how Jesus intended it. What do you think? Amen. And so, brothers and sisters, siblings in Christ, go out into a world that thinks of fairness in terms of pluses and minuses, black and white. And remember the God of forgiveness who calls us to live with generosity, putting relationships first, to love with radical, radical abandonment and an ever-present mercy. Hallelujah and amen.